Funding for the following program has been provided by this station and other public television stations and by a grant from the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies. My guest is a writer who believes that if learning to write is ever solved, uh, the day of fiction is over. Well, you, you might say that she has come closer to solving that problem than most of our writers, and uh, as a result, fiction's day is uh, not only over, but uh, fiction has a, a lot to thank her for. Uh, she is Eudora Welty. She's the author of a succession of brilliant short story collections, starting with Curtain of Green, uh, novels like Delta Wedding, um, Losing Battles, Optimus Daughter, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1972. And uh, when she's uh, not writing her own fiction, she's what she calls a born appreciator of other people's work and fiction. And uh, as she showed in a, a recent collection of uh, critical essays called The Eye of the Story, uh, she is Southern born and bred, as you will notice the moment she speaks. Uh, if you haven't heard her speak before, she lives in Jackson, Mississippi. And I, I feared for a long time that I wasn't going to get to uh, add her to coll my collection of writers I've had on the show, but I'm now delighted that she is finally here. Will you welcome Eudora Welty? Thank you. Hello again. Thank you. Uh, we've really taken you out of your native territory, and um, nothing could be farther from uh, almost any part of Mississippi than. Manhattan Island, where we now find her. So, Eudora, do you, do you feel a terrible cultural shock when you come to Manhattan? No, I love Manhattan. I spent all my girlhood trying to get here, coming up here. It used to be you could come to New York and live three weeks and go home again on the train for $100. The entire trip plus yeah. $100? Yes. It did. And uh, so I used to, it would take me a couple of years to get it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I've always I, I, loved to come. I know you're no I've stranger always, always to New York. I've always loved but to come here, and I love it. I love Manhattan. I feel a shock, even though I live here, when I've been away oh, for I two weeks. Oh, I get a shock when I first enter the street uh -huh. and see people's faces that are not looking at anyone else, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you, for, if some commissar ruled that you had to live here, if you were exiled to New York for the rest of your life, would your writing career be over? Who knows? I hope not, but no, I don't think so. But I can't write here now. You can't. You're talking about it in the future when I. Have you? Tr yeah. <laughs> have you tried? Uh, have you ever tried to yes, work on it? Yes, there's too much else I want to do. Yeah. I would find that true of any large city. Well, you're so tied to your roots and so on down well, there. I can I take things for granted down there, and all the answers to my questions are right out the window. How do you mean? Well, because. If I write about characters that live there, mm -hmm. I can take everything for granted. Mm -hmm. Up here, I'd feel I wouldn't be quite sure about. Oh, when you said right out the window, you I mean, mean they're, they're I mean nearby. my window, yeah. Yeah, I think the street. The, the, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I th I've tried to write about Europe. I wrote some short stories laid there, but they were mm -hmm. from the point of view of a Vista, such as myself. Because well, that's when you were. Uh, well, Paris was quite fashionable to write about then. Are you talking about short well, stories that you wrote and set in Paris as a younger... No, I didn't mean that. I meant uh, later on I wrote some... Well, I had a Guggenheim, and so I went to Europe, and mm. I didn't mean to write there because I was too busy looking. But I did after I got home, things that had stayed with me, late and on the boat to Italy and mm -hmm. yes. in Ireland and so on. But that's my own adventure into... Do you think of those as unsuccessful because they just weren't in your well, blood the way Mississippi is? Critics used to complain to me, why does she always write about Mississippi? And when I wrote that, they said, why don't she stick to what she knows best? <laughs> um, I like the stories. Grace. I was learning a lot by writing them, mm -hmm. trying to imagine myself into minds that I yeah. didn't know. But uh, there are writers who who say my work is totally a, a work of the imagination in the sense that I'm only comfortable writing about things I don't know at all. The late Robert well, Shaw, the actor, was a f decent novelist, and he mm -hmm. wrote a novel about Africa without ever having been there. I think it has to be one extreme or the other. I agree very much. Mm -hmm. When I wrote that novel, Delta Wedding, and you're married to a Delta lady, 
That's right. So she may have told you this. I don't know a thing about the Delta. No, <laughs> so, in fact, she was quite convinced. Um, so you must have... Uh, well, what is it about the Delta? That's a big question, but um, people always say, well, if you're not from the Delta, you don't understand the Delta, even though you're from Mississippi. You're and right. if you've never been there, it's another country. It is. And the people have another way of talking. But what is it that would make you, a native Mississippian, uneasy about being able to authentically write about that part of your state? Well, at the time I wrote Delta Wedding, I didn't know how little I knew. Mm -hmm. I did take the precaution of making my storyteller a nine-year-old child, so if, anybody, if any mistakes were made, they could say, well, she didn't know anything about her. <laughs> what, is but, it, what is a child uh, now? No, uh -huh. I had to, every part of Mississippi, I suppose every part of every state is mm -hmm. a little world to itself, you know that. Yeah. But the Delta is one that it was always so much richer, and everybody had so much, did so much, owned so much, spread over so much, and it was flat. Mm -hmm. All of it was different from Jackson, where I live. It's the only area that I know that is as flat as my part of the country. Where, it is. Where you can't it reminded conceive me. of what it's like to see that far unless you've been there. It reminded me of Nebraska, and I went there. Did it really? Mm-hmm. This yeah. time. Yeah. By the way, did you happen to know Willa Cather? No. I once saw her from a distance. I never knew her. By the way, we can pin down the pronunciation of her name. Which know. is Cather. Is it? And it's been pronounced wrong on this show many times by people who claim to know. And I learned from a friend of her sister's that she always used to say, You can say Cather if you'd rather, which was oh, supposed to stick it in your mind. I'm of, very well, glad to know that because I yeah. never had learned. Okay. Speaking of her, uh, when Willa Cather wrote, she called her towns various things, but one knew that it was Red Cloud, which yes. is where she. Um, Live, and you have various names for towns. Um, Cane, what is it? The one Cane Center. There's Victory. There's there, yeah. there are various names. Um, is it unfair to ask you if they're all Jackson, or does it matter? No, I can answer that, but they're not because I tried to write about smaller places in Jackson because it gave me a smaller stage, you know, to mm -hmm. where you knew everyone. And they are sort of typical of various sections of my state. Nothing is uh, at one actual, any actual place, but often will be a courthouse town in the Delta, or in the yeah. southern part, and so on. Only when I mention a real place, like Natchez, you yeah. know, it's just there as itself, like New Orleans. You can't yeah. go throwing Natchez around. No, uh, or New Orleans, for that matter. No, well, it's for the same reason. <laughs> if you were looking for your break today as a writer and you know where the age you were when you began and trying to break in and so on uh death of a traveling salesman i guess was your first real yes, break it was. wasn't it uh and that's a short story there have been articles about the death of the short story the illness of the short story the fact mm -hmm. that it's a dying or malingering form now um, would you have to break through with a novel today to to make it i don't it? know they told me i would then they did. I mean, to get national publication, mm -hmm. you know. Well, Death of a Traveling Salesman was just in a little magazine in Athens, Ohio. It was years later before I yeah. uh, sold a story to the Atlantic Monthly, which meant that readers, a general publication. Mm -hmm. That took me six years, I guess, to do and that. And uh, But the, as far as a book of short stories went by an unknown writer, that would be pretty hard today, but when I did it, no one could believe it. I couldn't either. It even, was just wonderful luck. Even in those days when short stories were, there were f many outlets for them, uh, magazines were. and so on. They're almost all have dried up now. That's true. But, I worry yeah. very much about the young short story writer today. There's no way you can appear where you'll be re read. Yeah, th someone That's said the point. little magazines are too little. They are. And the and New Yorker ephemeral. is hard to get into. And, uh, and too ephemeral, too. And you had a powerful ally. Well, F Ford Maddox Ford, some people's favorite writer, yeah. uh, was uh, complaining about the neglect of your talent early on. Well, he, that's part of my luck. I've been lucky all my life. Yeah. He sent me a letter out of the blue and said, uh, I believe Catherine Ann Porter had written to him about my work. Mm -hmm. He said, would you like me to try to sell these stories? I think I could sell them in England. But he, uh, unfortunately, 
for everybody, not just me. He died very soon after that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether he could have done it or not. You know, there's a record, I wish I owned it, I only heard it once, of you reading a couple of short stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you read so well, but it's something also so wonderfully uh, soothing about the way you, you read your stories. Not all authors read them well. I'd love to play the record when I'm sick. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I hope they don't put that on the jacket. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Music to be sick by. <laughs> <Music>. <laughs> but no, uh, it, it, it's the sort of, um, the, 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 not only the, is the writing wonderful, but the, the way you read it is so, is so marvelous. W would you read a sample of something for us now? I'll try not to become sick during it. Um. Well, that'll worry me. Get some water. Oh, I'll read one that's not I'll on the right. record, and then just a little piece of one. Because any time there's a writer on, there have to be a certain number of viewers who are not familiar with the work. You know, obviously, television reaches oh, so sure. many people. Uh, I can't help noticing this is open to the wide net. Was that the one you're looking for? Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Okay. Do you want me to explain what it is? Sure. This is an early story called The Wide Net, and... Uh, it's just about a bunch of boys that have a day on the river, but, but the object is to search for the wife of William Wallace Jameson, who tells him she's going to drown himself. I'll explain all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's just the story of a day and a search, and although he thinks his wife is drowned, they have an awfully good time, and it ends up with a fish fry and all kinds of things. My point being that a search is the same, whether it's for happiness or for joy. I mean, for joy or sorrow. Mm -hmm. There's a, something about that, a, the human impulse to go out, everybody together, and make a hunt for something, a search. It was a kind of joyous story. I'll just read a, a little bit. You stop me. I may tend not to stop you, but um, no, no. please proceed. Really, it is short. William Wallace Jameson's wife, Hazel, was going to have a baby, but this was October, and it was six months away, and she acted exactly so it would be tomorrow. When he came in the room, she would not speak to him, but would look as straight at nothing as she could with her eyes glowing. If he only touched her, she stuck out her tongue or ran around the table. So one night, he went out with two of the boys down the road and stayed out all night. But that was the worst thing yet because when he came home in the early morning, Hazel had vanished. He went through the house not believing his eyes, balancing with both hands out, his yellow cowlick rising on end. And then he turned the kitchen inside out looking for her, but it did no good. Then when he got back to the front room, he saw she had left him a little letter in an envelope. That was doing something behind someone's back. He took out the letter, pushed it open, held it out at a distance from his eyes, but after one look, he was scared to read the exact words, and he crushed the whole thing in his hand instantly, but what it had said was that she would not put up with him after that and was going to the river to drown herself. Drown herself? But she's in mortal fear of the water. He ran out front, his face red like the red of the pick cotton field he ran over, and down in the road he gave a loud shout for Virgil Thomas, who was just going in his own house, to come out again. They met halfway between the farms under the shade tree. Haven't you had enough of the night? asked Virgil. There they were, their pants all covered with dust and dew, and they had to carry the third man home flat between them. I've lost Hazel. She's vanished. She went to drown herself. Why, that ain't like Hazel, said Virgil. William Wallace reached out and shook him. You heard me. Don't you know we have to drag the rubber right this minute? You ain't got nothing to do till spring. Let me go set foot inside the house and speak to my mother and tell her stir and I'll come back. This will take the wide net, said William Wallace. His eyebrows gathered and he was talking to himself. How come Hazel would go and do that way, asked Virgil as they started out. William Wallace said, I reckon she got lonesome. That don't argue. Drown herself for getting lonesome? My mother gets lonesome. Well, said William Wallace, it argues for Hazel. Why did I ever think I could stay out all night? Just something come over you. First it was just a carnival at Carthage and I had to let them guess my weight and after that, 
It was nice to be sitting on your neck in a ditch singing, prompted Virgil, in the moonlight, and playing on a harmonica like you can play. Even if Hazel did sit home knowing I was drunk, that wouldn't kill her, said William Wallace. What she knows ain't ever killed her yet. She's smart, too, for a girl, he said. She's a lot smarter than her cousin Beulah, said Virgil, and especially Edna Earl, that never did get to be what you'd call a heavy thinker. Edna Earl could sit and ponder all day on how the little tail of the sea got through the L and the Coca-Cola sign. Hazel is smart, said William Wallace. They walked on. You ought to see her pantry shelf. It looks like a hundred jars when you open the door. I don't see how she could turn around and jump in the river. It's a woman's trick. I always behaved before till the one night, last night. Yeah, but the one night, said Virgil, and she was waiting to take advantage. She jumped in the river because she was scared to death of the water, and that was to make it worse, he said. She remembered how I used to have to pick her up and carry her over the oak log bridge, how she'd shut her eyes and make a dead weight and hold me around the neck just by a little creek. I don't see how she brought herself to jump. Jump backward, said Virgil. Didn't look. Is that enough? That was not every word of the story, uh, as we know. But no, they find her. That, that, she was that, home all the time. <laughs> gee, that's wonderful. No. Did, did you have that shocking experience most people do when you first hear your own voice? To think, yes. that can't be me. I've never sounded that bad. Have I been sounding that way all my life? Right. Because I'm sure it must so, be universal. Well, yours is so wonderful that I thought maybe you would be the exception to oh, that. Oh, yeah. What is it about Southern names? Is it just, is it a false impression that I have, or is it that my wife's friends of her age and, and uh, all of other generations also have such wonderful names? You're the only Eudora I've ever heard of. Do you know of others? Yeah, I was named after my grandmother in Virginia, who was from Virginia. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right there. They love fine and fancy names. And I had a theory once that the... Um, a lot of the fanciest names belong to very poor people besides the family kind of inherited names and so on. And I figured that's all they had to give the children. They think, well, I can't even buy them a pair of shoes, but I can name them Esmeralda <laughs> or something. <laughs> it's, a, it's something you can give somebody. I want to get back to something about that story, but that is so interesting to me. And, and it, it it's may not funny. Be true. We did not conspire, did we, to, that, no, we did. that I would tell you to no. ask that because. Uh, besides writing down the names of some of her close friends, my wife gave me the, some of her friends' names, the ladies, are Sykes, Aiden, Sethel, Garen, Wingfield, Legrand, Caledonia, and um, there's a lady in Greenwood named Claire Broadway Wade. Oh, that's lovely. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And Augusta Claiborne. There's no doubt that oh, that's, that's a southern name. Oh, no. Gaden, Sykes Equin, I mentioned that one. and. Uh, but just as you said, uh, I believe it was her friend Aidan Pryor's mother's cook, whose name was, and there's some dispute about a part of this, <clears throat> Martha Mosella Caroline Jefferson, Highway Beauty Spot, Temptation Touch Me Not, Mother's Joy, Father's Pride, Darling Landlady. I believe it. I now, my wife remembers it as Darlin' Landlady, and her friend Aiden remembers it as Mother's Joy, Father's Pride, Darlin' Grandbaby. That's good. A grandbaby is a Southern expression, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Well, I know of somebody's cook, but I never knew her. His name was Talitha, Tabitha, Tamilla, to Jane, to Cataline, to Cataline, Kitty Fisher, Valentine, Floyd. It's <laughs> <laughs> a last name. Was also. Floyd at the end? Yeah, that was at the end. I think that was her last name. <laughs> the wonderful <laughs> anticlimax. I like, Beautiful you name. know, Cataline is how long, old Cataline, must we Cataline. hear these orations? Oh, to Cataline, yes. it's a T and apostrophe. To Cataline. To Cataline. To Cataline. Where do you reckon that came from? I have no idea, but I do know that a friend of mine was in a maternity ward, and the lady in there, who was not lettered, you might say, uh, had heard a wonderful name, and she was going to name her next baby that name. And she said, well, what is the name you heard? And she said, Placenta. Yeah. Now, that's, that, that's is a nice, that is a nice name. If you don't 
It's funny about words, isn't it? If you don't know what they mean, they sound beautiful. The, I mean, and it is a beautiful name. It's a beautiful name, yeah. Awesome. There's a black child named June Baby. Oh, and yeah. He's that. But that's a grand name. I'd be glad to be named that. Yeah. Sort of like a June Bug Baby. <laughs> <laughs> And then there are the diminutive names that the people are called even later in life when they weigh 300 pounds oh, and uh, are, are in their yeah, 70s. Yeah, I know many still like little, that. Little teat blossom and right. things like baby that. Baby sister. Yeah. Or sister baby. Sister baby. And there's big Garen and little Garen, mm -hmm. although the one may be bigger than the other. Uh, in that story, that obviously your, your, your ear for dialogue is perfect and, um, and you do hear people talking that way. My, it's my feeling that in the South, more people talk like good writing, or is it the other way around? It's almost like the Irish phenomenon, where you can hear oh. what sounds like publishable dialogue. Gee, uh, that's a wonderful thought. I don't know. That doesn't mean it's easy to be a writer in the South, because all you have to do is copy down what people say, of course. But uh, Well, it may it all a, go back to the... Everybody in the South really does like to talk, as you know. From the Delta, they like it best of all. Oh, I shut uh, up down there. I just listen to them talk for well, hours I on end. I do too. End. I do too. And it's but you know, but then you know how everything sounds, and it's been told so many times. Mm -hmm. And sometimes two people are telling the same story in the same room, and you can hear it uh, <laughs> in both uh, sides. But it's a, a long oral tradition, so I think it both means that's the way you learn how people talk, and it accustoms mm -hmm. you to writing that way you have to do a lot to it when you write of course to make it sound like yeah it really is there's an art to reproducing or reproducing well, you would know that above all, everything how uh the difference between what you think you say and what you do say yes when you if you ever see a transcript of something you thought you said well, quite well it's a startling experience that's what i meant yeah impossible uh, when uh, Chris Porterfield and I wrote the book Cavett, we wrote it in dialogue form, and I wrote mine and he wrote his, and uh, it was not made that clear that it was mm -hmm. not a transcript to some readers. Yeah. So we didn't know whether to take credit for talking that well, because we were able to fake, yeah. make it just the way we wanted it, uh, or for writing the way people talk, which you, if, if, if we did either one of those. Well, you were. Very you, were, strange. you faced it head on. What did you do? Uh, I just you always denied it. that it was taped, because it was not. People would always mm -hmm. say, did you edit the tapes much? But uh, when, when, you, um, when you sit down to write a short story, Dora, do you have to make some mental gear shift that's totally different from the mindset that you use when you sit down to write a novel? Yeah. Can you explain what that is? Can anybody? Well, I can explain how it is for me. It's probably different. No, I think this must be true of all the writers. Is that a short story is really, it's like a one-time thing, a one, the whole thing is one impulse. I believe it's a lyrical impulse, you know, to celebrate something in a way, I mean, in general. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it shouldn't slack from the beginning to the end. It should be like a string drawn very tightly, or maybe something that will magnetize, maybe a, I hope this doesn't get written down, it doesn't make a grain of sense. I mean. Uh, the idea okay. is a driving, dynamic kind of thing that goes from the beginning right straight through to the end, even though it may not be apparent to the reader. You can't afford any lulls in a short story. No, and everything must pertain to it, and it should be written, ideally, at one sitting. Of course, you can't do it. I mean, maybe I can't. Mm -hmm. Whereas a novel must have many slacks and legs. I see it all as a kind of... Uh, Tautness in a short story. It has to be tension. Yeah, a real mm -hmm. tension of yeah. of mood at least, or, or what you're trying to do. So you couldn't start out um, writing a novel like that. Mm -hmm. The only times I've done it is when I think I'm writing a short story, and it's a novel. And it gets long. I made that mistake, but you yes, you referred to the long story as yeah maybe the ideal form if we, if there were such a thing. Uh, but well, a short story is entirely different and uh, much my preference and also much harder, I think. People would think it's easier. They'd say he doesn't have a novel in him, but he could dash off a short story. That's right. But uh, Do you know anyone who ha can write a short story at one sitting? I mean, who's respectable? Because you say the ideal no. thing would be to... I guess the impression should be that it was written mm -hmm. straight through. Uh, well, I don't know. No, I don't know anybody, but 
<clears throat> what I try to do is to write uh, essential parts straight through at one time. Mm -hmm. Not to, they won't be left that way, but you know, to get it down. Mm -hmm. And then to work on it with this thing to go by and try to keep that, what I'm trying. And then if possible, after hundreds and hundreds of revisions, to write the last time at one time, at one blow. Straight through. So that that gives you the same feeling of taking mm -hmm. off. Can you do that last version that way? Can you literally sit down at your writing table in front of your typewriter and, and sit there for eight hours or whatever it takes? I used to be able to, but now I write too... The stories are too long. Mm -hmm. that's, but that's still the ideal way. Yeah. If, I, if I knew how enough, I'd always do it. I saw a tape of you one time um, actually cutting your story, and it's, you appeared to be sewing it together. You, you yes, were sir. cutting it into strips and putting it together with scotch pins. tape, or pins, is pins. it? That yeah, that's why it looked better. like sewing. It looked like pattern then. Yeah, I remember thinking, well, and I wish I could come up with that line from Yeats about writing, about where he says that the stitching and unstitching must not show. Yes, I know what you're talking about, but I, I can't either. Yeah. Um, maybe by tomorrow night we will have found it in our crack research. All right, I'll uh, pin it up. We can pin it onto this tape. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I wonder, people always plague writers with the question, can you teach me to write? Can you help mm -hmm. me to write? Some people say, if you have to ask, then you're not a writer. But why shouldn't there be such a thing as a latent writing talent, the way there can be a latent acting talent, that the right teacher or the right instructor or inspirer or guru can bring out? I think if it's latent, it's not strong enough. Because writing is very, a lot of people do have a latent talent, mm -hmm. but if, it's, if it has that vitality, which it takes, you know, something alive, I think writing is alive, I mean, you try, it's got to be strong enough to bust through, you know. Yeah. And uh, if, it, if it isn't, it's too feeble. Latent isn't enough. It should be a talent maybe that needs to be contained rather than I do brought think out. that there are many things you can be helped by in, in your writing. I never had any uh, teaching or took any writing courses, so I can't speak for myself, but I have um, seen it in colleges and things. There's so many things, you, headaches you could save a young writer. You know, do you think, yeah. you know, you really could help them. You can't help in the main thing, that is, what's inside, because it all comes from inside. Eudora, or Miss Eudora, as your friends call you, <laughs> no. I, I promise not to say, because it, it means something somewhat different in the South. This is an awkward moment for me, because we're out of time. What you're saying is so fascinating, and students of writing are hanging on your every word. Mm -hmm. Is it conceivable to seduce you here on the air to continuing this after a, a pause, and perhaps it would be on the following night? Sure, if you'd like to. Okay. I'll think it over. <laughs> oh, will you? Because oh. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. So you're a true Southerner, which uh, I'm most comfortable with true Southerners. I would love to coax you for another 30 minutes tomorrow night. We will see you tomorrow night then, it appears. Thank you and good night. Your door will. Funding for The Dick Cavett Show has been provided by this station and other public television stations and by a grant from the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies.